a Sociedad Civil solicitante su presencia esta tarde y traer este tema a nuestra atención. Eh, me acompañan en esta mesa, identifico en primer lugar a la comisionada Margaret May McCauley, quien es eh, relatora eh, para Estados Unidos y para varios países del Caribe angloparlante. Me acompaña también el comisionado Luis Ernesto Vargas, la secretaria ejecutiva adjunta para el sistema de casos y peticiones Marisol Blanchard eh, y un servidor, eh, soy Joel Hernández, el primer vicepresidente de la comisión y presente aquí en razón de mi carácter de relator para personas privadas de la libertad. Eh, sabemos que el propósito de esta audiencia es que los solicitantes nos proporcionen información actualizada sobre la situación de derechos humanos en los países angloparlantes del Caribe frente a la existencia de la pena de muerte en algunos de estos países. En, para poder desarrollar esta audiencia vamos a darle hasta 25 minutos a los solicitantes para que presenten su, sus puntos de vista y posteriormente harán uso de la mesa, uso de la palabra a los miembros de esta mesa para conclusiones finales a cargo de ustedes. En la medida en la que vayamos acercándonos al, al término del tiempo, eh, iré señalando con estas banderitas. Eh, dicho esto, tienen la palabra ustedes hasta por 25 minutos. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. Good afternoon, distinguished commissioners, adjunct executive secretary and representatives, um, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and I apologize for sitting here so I can control the PowerPoint while I present. In 2010, the European Court expressly declared the death penalty itself to be contrary to the basic dictates of humanity. The court stated, judicial execution involves the deliberate and premeditated destruction of a human being by the state authorities. Whatever the method of execution, the extinction of life involves some physical pain. In addition, the foreknowledge of death at the hands of the state must inev inevitably give rise to intense psychological suffering. Honorable commissioners, we believe that this statement from the European Court sets the tone for our presentation today, as do these headlines from the last six months across the Caribbean. We are here today to urge the Commission to adopt a similar framework under the American Convention on Human Rights. My name is Casey, and my colleagues Malaney, Saul, and I appreciate the opportunity to come here today to discuss this important issue. In the year 1996, Lars Dunn Cornwall was sentenced to the mandatory death penalty in Antigua. He was kept in maximum security in Her Majesty's prison, which was built in 1735 to hold 150 people. During the time he spent on death row, the prison's population swelled from 170 to 371. On the 20th of January 2000, Mr. Cornwall was read a warrant for his execution. He was measured and had his coffin built for him. He spent 23 hours a day, confined to his cell, allowed out for only an hour to attend to his hygienic and recreational needs. Each time he left his cell to go to the bathroom, he would pass his own coffin. His grave was dug in the prison yard, gallows were built, and each day leading to his execution, Mr. Cornwall could hear the gallows being tested. One day before his scheduled execution, a stay was granted by the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. Fifteen years after he was sentenced to death, Mr. Cornwall's death sentence was declared unconstitutional. An order was made for his resentencing but he was not immediately informed of this order. He would spend another year on death row before he received this notice. In 2016, the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court resentenced Mr. Cornwall to a term of 30 years imprisonment. Due to time already served, he was released immediately. He had spent a total of 20 years on death row in a maximum security prison under an unconstitutional mandatory death sentence. Honorable Commissioners, we put forward today that Mr. Cornwall's case sums up perfectly the precarious nature of the death penalty in the English-speaking countries of the Caribbean, and it highlights the need for this commission to act. 
Mr. Cornwall was the last person sentenced to death in Antigua, but the English-speaking Caribbean currently has a population of at least 67 persons on death row. This population includes survivors of domestic violence, people with mental disorders, and people facing prolonged periods of detention. Indeed, 12 of the 14 retentionist OAS member states are in the English-speaking Caribbean. Barbados has 10 people under sentence of death, Guyana has 15, including two women, and Trinidad and Tobago has 42. Notably, Trinidad and Tobago maintains a mandatory death penalty. Yet, as Mr. Cornwall's case demonstrates, there have been positive steps towards the restriction of the death penalty, thanks to the judicial reforms by the domestic courts and limitations imposed by the Inter-American system. Decisions of the Inter-American Courts of Human Rights, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, and the Caribbean Court of Justice have curbed the application of the mandatory death penalty in these countries, except in Trinidad and Tobago, and have eliminated executions after long periods spent on death row. The death penalty is reserved for the most serious cases of intentional homicide, where there is no realistic prospect of reform, or the offender and a, le and a lesser punishment would not achieve sentencing objectives. Due process rights must be respected and condemned prisoners must be able to participate meaningfully in the clemency process. A lack of compliance with procedural requirements in the clemency process is judicially reviewable. In fact, all the English-speaking Caribbean jurisdictions are considered de facto abolitionists by the United Nations, as none of them have carried out an execution in the last 10 years. But, as Mr. Cornwall's case demonstrates, the death penalty still creates victims of human rights violations. All of these independent English-speaking Caribbean countries continue to retain the death penalty as a punishment for all or some types of murder. Despite the constraints on the imposition and application of the death penalty, their individual governments and legislatures show no inclination towards abolition. None of these countries has ratified the protocol to the American Convention on Human Rights to abolish the death penalty, nor the second optional protocol to the ICCPR aimed at abolishing the death penalty. They consistently vote against the UN's biennial resolution calling for a moratorium on executions. Although in December 2018, positively, Antigua and Barbuda abstained and Dominica voted in favor of the resolution for the first time. Some countries continue to impose a sentence of death, including in the past few years. I will now give the floor to my colleague, Melanie, to underscore both shortcomings in the process and worrisome developments and circumstances around application of the death penalty, and then to Saul to lay out how this honorable commission can construct the pathway to abolition. Thank you, Casey, and thank you, commissioners, for the opportunity to speak here today on this critical issue. As the commission has consistently recognized, the right to life is the supreme right of human beings and a prerequisite for the enjoyment of all other rights. Under Article 4.2 of the American Convention, countries that have not abolished the death penalty must comply with a series of restrictions and established limitations on the implementation of the death penalty. The Commission has also recognized that the right to due process plays an essential role in guaranteeing the protection of the rights of persons sentenced to death. The Commission has expressed the view that in death penalty cases, there is a heightened level of scrutiny as death is qualitatively different from other penalties and procedures. The right to humane treatment and the right not to be subjected to cruel, degrading, and unusual punishment is also of critical importance in death penalty cases. And yet, in the English-speaking Caribbean, those who are on death row are often victims of shortcomings in the criminal justice system. A cross-cutting concern is the issue of due process. The case of Charles Laplace from St. Kitts provides a visceral example of this issue in the context of the English-speaking Caribbean. In 2006, Mr. Laplace was sentenced to death for the murder of his wife. In 2008, he was executed tr following a troubling set of circumstances. First, commissioners, the Court of Appeal never considered the substance of his appeal and the safety of his convictions. Rather, they dismissed the appeal on technical grounds for being filed out of time. This, of course, raises serious concerns about the quality and competence of his legal representation. And moreover, he was not provided with the necessary legal assistance to take his case to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. 
Additionally, commissioners, Mr. Laplace's execution was shrouded in secrecy. The government only issued a press release after the execution, depriving human rights advocates of the opportunity to intervene. This suggests that the decision by the executive to execute did not comply with requirements of transparency, nor basic fairness. Another major concern is the impact of the death penalty on vulnerable groups, including women, persons with mental disabilities, and those with intersectional identities. As the Commission is already aware, people sentenced to death in the Caribbean are most often the least powerful and most marginalized. Mental health is often a worrying factor, and yet states fail to routinely assess those facing the death penalty for mental health challenges and psychosocial disabilities. The recent case of Jay Chandler illustrates this issue. Mr. Chandler was sentenced to death in Trinidad and Tobago in 2011 for stabbing another prisoner with a homemade knife. He was never assessed by mental health experts prior to his trial, nor his appeal, despite the fact that a subsequent report from a forensic psychiatrist suggests he suffered from episodes of psychosis. He remains on the sentence of death today, even though he has spent more than eight years facing execution. So commissioners, this raises another key issue, and that is the death row phenomenon, or in other words, the impact of prolonged periods of, deten of detention on death row. The Judicial Committee of the Privy Council has consistently found that the death row phenomenon amounts to cruel, inhuman, and degrading punishment. The Commission, for its part, has also denounced the death row phenomenon, recognizing that the impact of long-term deprivation of liberty on death row includes severe mental trauma and physical deterioration in prisoners on the sentence of death. In fact, in the 2017 case of Victor Saldano against the United States, the Commission said the very fact of spending 20 years on death row is excessive and inhuman, and it could also constitute a form of torture. Despite the clarity of these standards, implementation is sporadic at best, with prisoners routinely spending excessive periods on the sentence of death. In Mr. Chandler's case, his prolonged detention for eight years on death row breaches his constitutional rights as set out by the Privy Council and also breaches inter-American standards. Another example is the case of Mr. Cornwall mentioned by my colleague earlier. And after almost 20 years on death row, Mr. Cornwall was informed by prison authorities that he was eligible to be moved from death row to the general population of the prison. But commissioners, Mr. Cornwall declined, stating, the yard is hell. He had become entirely isolated and refused to have any contact with other prisoners. Honorable commissioners, building on these stories, my final point is that the death penalty is inherently flawed and we need to move beyond restriction to abolition without delay. The death penalty cannot be effectively restricted any more than has already been done in the English-speaking Caribbean. We recognize that active inter intervention by the domestic judiciary and international tribunals have reformed outdated practices, but even a restrictive death penalty that delimits its application and scope still creates human rights victims. A highly selective discretionary system is a step in the, in the right direction, but it is a fallacy to suppose that the introduction of judicial discretion can eliminate arbitrariness and inequity in the infliction of the death penalty. No matter how restrictive the guidelines may be, it is impossible to devise a system for administering a discretionary death penalty that will eliminate arbitrary judgments of who among the convicted should be selected as worthy of death. It is often nothing more than a lethal lottery, and those who are sentenced to death and executed are much more likely to be among the least powerful of those convicted of capital murders. An element of subjectivity is inevitable in the decision to pursue the death penalty and in, in deciding whether it should be imposed and carried out. There are also concerns about the fairness and tra transparency of the clemency process. The standards, again, are clearly defined in domestic and international law, but implementation is erratic, with little evidence of compliance with the procedural requirements of nat nat natural justice or the human rights principles required by the inter-American system. Most worryingly, commissioners, subsequently to, subsequent to judicial progress, some countries have taken retrograde measures which further deny effective compliance with the rights embodied in the American Convention. 
Both Jamaica in 2011 and Barbados in 2002 enacted constitutional measures to prevent challenges to a delay in execution of a death sentence. In addition, both the constitutions of Jamaica and Barbados prevent challenge to the execution of a death sentence because of physical conditions of detention. Honorable commissioners, the time has come to call for outright abolition as a human rights obligation underlying the spirit and aspiration of the convention. A new empirical study actually reveals that strength of support for the death penalty is not as entrenched in the English-speaking Caribbean as one would presume. Of 100 high-level opinion leaders interviewed across Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean between 2018 and 19, 52% were personally in favor of the abolition of the death penalty. Regarding the question of public opinion, 76% believe that the abolition of the death penalty would be accepted in time by the majority of citizens once legislation was passed. Now, we know from international experience that perceptions of public opinion cannot lead the debate on the death penalty or justify departure from human rights commitments. Political leadership must be exercised. Notably, a full 70% of those interviewed stated that they would either support legislation brought forward to abolish the death penalty or at least not oppose it. While there has been a clear lack of momentum towards complete abolition across the region, this passivity is not reflective of any significant op opposition to, the ab to abolition, but rather a reluctance to, the question, um, to question the status quo. And this is where the Honorable Commission can play a pivotal role. Albeit currently lacking a collective regional voice pushing for abolition with the appropriate encouragement and guidance from the Honorable Commission could precipitate a major step towards the final removal of capital punishment from the region. Commissioners, I now turn things over to my colleague Saul, who will set out how the Commission can build on existing positive state practice and growing public support to lead this collective voice and join its pair of human rights bodies in making abolition a human rights objective in itself. Thank you. Thank you, Mulaney, uh, distinguished commissioners. As my colleagues have established, the commission's position in favor of abolition of the death penalty has always been clear and consistent. And this matches the growing and unmistakable international trend towards the abolition of the death penalty. Around 160 countries in the world have today either abolished the death penalty in law, introduced a moratorium, or do not practice it. In 2018, only 22 countries around the world carried out executions, with the United States the only active retentionist state within the OAS. In 2010, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that such transformation in the state practice of Council of Europe member states was strongly indicative that interpretation of the right to life had been impliedly altered by regional norm. Consequently, under present-day standards, a death sentence would be inhuman and degrading punishment across the European region in violation of the European Convention on Human Rights. Most recently, at the universal level, the United Nations Human Rights Committee's General Comment Number 36 on the right to life, interpreting Article 6 of the ICCPR, from October 2018, affirms the following. States, and I quote, should be on an irrevocable path towards complete eradication of the death penalty de facto and de jure in the foreseeable future. Further, the Human Rights Committee stressed that the death penalty cannot be reconciled with full respect for the right to life and that abolition of the death penalty is desirable and necessary for the enhancement of human dignity and the progressive development of human rights. The committee recognized that the increasing number of abolitionist states, as well as non-abolitionist states who have introduced a de facto moratorium on the exercise of the death penalty, and I quote again, suggests that considerable progress may have been made towards establishing an agreement between state parties to consider the death penalty as a cruel, inhuman, and degrading form of punishment. In the Americas, we remind the Commission that Article 44.2 of the American Convention was never intended to justify the permanent retention of the death penalty. In the 1983 advisory opinion on restrictions to the death penalty, the Inter-American Court explained that the gradual disappearance of the death penalty 
accords with the spirit and purposes underlying both the American Declaration and the American Convention. Between 1983 and 2012, when this Honorable Commission released its report on the death penalty in the inter-American system, seven OAS member states had abolished the death penalty. Since the Commission's reminder in its report that the ultimate objective is, is the abolition of the death penalty within the inter-American system, Bolivia in 2013 and Suriname in 2015 abolished the death penalty for all crimes. Guatemala abolished the death penalty for ordinary crimes in 2017. This shows that the inter-American system's efforts towards abolition are clearly working. Now for the first time, a minority of 14 OAS me member states retain the death penalty. Interestingly, 12 of them are in the English-speaking Caribbean, and they are all regarded by the United Nations as abolitionists de facto. The only actively executing OAS member state is the United States, and this year they have carried out 17 executions, but this is confined to seven retention estates and is not representative of a countrywide practice. The right to life in Article 6 of the Covenant, while similar to Article 4, contains an additional provision in Paragraph 6. This states that nothing in this article shall be, shall be invoked to delay or to prevent the abolition of capital punishment by any state party to the present covenant. The Human Rights Committee's recent general comment gives guidance on the interpretation of Article 6.6, reaffirming the pro-abolitionist spirit of the Covenant. This Honourable Commission consistently recognises the relevance of the Committee's guidance and shares a similar standpoint towards eradicating the use of capital punishment within the inter-American system. In this case, it is particularly pertinent since OAS retention estates have ratified the ICCPR at a higher rate than the American Convention. As the Inter-American Court of Human Rights stated in its groundbreaking 2017 opinion on gender identity, equality, and non-discrimination with regard to same-sex couples, I quote, human rights treaties are live instruments whose interpretation has to accompany the evolution of the times and life's current conditions. The court went on to state that the American Convention must be interpreted in light most favorable to the person and to the evolution of fundamental rights in contemporary international law. As reflected in the approach of the European Court of Human Rights in declaring the death penalty tantamount to inhuman and degrading treatment and punishment, so too must the issue of the abolition of the death penalty within the inter-American system evolve with the times. Human rights obligations must catch up to regional and international norms. This commission has a real opportunity to help advance a regional trend towards abolition in English-speaking Caribbean countries. The largest cohort of OAS retention is states by pushing those countries for abolition without delay or exception. Accordingly, we would respectfully request the following recommendations to be made by this distinguished commission. Firstly, to urge OAS retention is states to, more, to move towards the complete eradication of the death penalty, de facto and de jure, in the foreseeable future, and remind them that Article 4.2 of the American Convention on Human Rights should not be interpreted as justifying delay in bringing about abolition. Secondly, to request information from all OAS retention estates on the prisoners on death row, including disaggregated information on their gender, demographics, length of sentence, and the measures taken to eradicate the death penalty in their respective jurisdictions. Further, to urge OAS member states that have not done so to ratify the American Convention on Human Rights and the protocol to the American Convention on Human Rights to abolish the death penalty. We would also urge the Commission to conduct a fact-finding visit to the places of detention which house prisoners on death row, namely in Barbados, Guyana, and Trinidad and Tobago, so that this Commission can gather testimonies on the conditions of detention for death row prisoners. Importantly, we would urge this Commission to request a new advisory opinion to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights as established in Article 64.1 of the American Convention on Human Rights on the contemporary current meaning of Article 4.2 of the American Convention on Human Rights 
particularly in light of developments in the universal human rights system. We would also urge this Honourable Commission to engage with the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights with a view to taking joint action with UN human rights me mechanisms to promote the eradication of the death penalty in OAS retention estates, including by way of a joint declaration on the normative framework governing the application of the death penalty. And finally, Honourable Commission, we would ask that the information presented today be included in the information presented in this Commission's annual report. Uh, we thank you very much. Thank you so much to all speakers for bringing this matter to the attention of this Commission. It's, it's uh, of uh, utmost importance that we take uh, uh, more steps forward in order to advance to the abolition of the penalty in the continent. And I want to begin with uh, Commissioner McCauley, if she allows me. We normally like to be last, but on the basis that he who shall be first or choose to be first will be last. Um, but um, I am very passionately interested in the abolition of the death penalty, uh, privately and as a human rights defender. Um, privately to the extent, and I say this openly, that I refused an appointment to the Supreme Court in Jamaica many years ago, when the death penalty was mandatory there. I, I could not face the thought of um, passing the sentence of death on anyone. And the first time I experienced the passage of death on an accused person, uh, and I, had, I was one of the defense counsel in the case, um, was where, at the time when the judge would put a black cloth on the wig, on his wig, and it was he then, there were no women on the bench, and passed the sentence of death. It so adversely affected me, I was ill for four days and stayed in bed. It is cruel and inhuman for us to do this, and I think it's a state-sponsored vengeance and, and homicide. And Throughout my practice of law in, in Jamaica, we, I experienced, both when I, I practiced as a junior with my husband and on my own, instances, so many instances of incorrect persons being put on trial, following so-called proper investigation. And, and in lots of those instances, through our actions in demanding that certain tests and certain paths be followed, the result was that the DPP's office had to go into court and terminate the trial because the, 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 the pursuit of what we asked for showed that it was a wrong defendant that was before the court. And normally at that time, these persons who were accused of murder were found guilty by and large. A very few were acquitted. And so you can imagine the number of innocent people who would have gone to death row and during the time of mandatory penalty would have died. And that used to give me nightmares. In fact, I never ate during those trials. Then my experience at the Inter-American Court, and I must say that I am sadly disappointed in Barbados because whilst a judge there I sat on two cases on, on death penalty. And in both instances, the court made its, its directives about the change which had to take place in the laws in the Constitution and the Offenses Against the Persons Act in, in, in Barbados. And on each occasion in our monitoring of these judgments, Barbados indicated to us that they were taking steps to do so. And I ended my service of the court as a judge in 2012. It is now 2019, and they haven't done so. I'm sadly disappointed in them. And, and I think perhaps with a bit of pressure from us and the court, uh, um, 
we might be able to push the issue. Um, I really thank you for bringing this matter up before um, the Commission. And I, I do agree with you that we can help a great deal. And that the visits you suggest would be very effective for us to go, especially rapporteur um, for persons deprived of liberty, to go and visit those prisons where these people are kept uh, um, and use that um, in our recommendations um, about lifting the death penalty. And also there is the, the system of clemency, which the court held when I was there, was insufficient in the sense that we cannot say that it's a legal process. The, the, the condemned person, well, mostly in Jamaica it was men, the condemned person is not there, has to send their, their, their applications and petition by writing. It is made up of some retired judicial persons and lawyers, um, but it, it is a, a group of mixed peoples. But some of them wouldn't even understand the, the records of the trial. And they come to a decision whether they should proceed with the execution or not. Um, so these, these um, clemency hearings were, as far as I was concerned, egregious acts. So I think I have expanded and exhaled enough. So I give my other colleagues <laughs> time to say something. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Vargas. Muchas gracias, Presidente, y gracias a ustedes también por traer el tema. Desde entrada podríamos advertir o decir, afirmar tajantemente que nosotros estamos en contra de manera muy radical, contra esta pena capital, que nos parece obviamente que es simple y llanamente la expresión más clara del atentado contra el derecho principal de los derechos humanos, que es el derecho a la vida. Cada vez que nosotros tenemos que trabajar para hacer informes de fondo sobre temas como el corredor de la muerte, enfrentamos casos más dramáticos. Uno ya no sabe sinceramente qué pensar. Y estoy hablando de casos que se dan, por ejemplo, en Estados Unidos, donde el debido proceso se convierte en un remedio de justicia cuando se quiere perseguir a alguien porque es afro o porque es latino. Eh, incluso hay personas que de otras nacionalidades, incluso ingleses, como estuvimos viendo recientemente, eh, que son sometidos a ese corredor de la muerte, que es también otra expresión contundente de lo que es un trato cruel, inhumano, degradante. Pasar tantos meses humillado, sometido, y en espera, simplemente, como ustedes han dicho aquí, como haciendo, es decir, pasando por su ataúd permanentemente, por lo que va a ser su féretro permanentemente. Y el caso de Laplace, que tú has traído a colación, en el que se puso sobre el tapete una especie de tensión, para mí, imposible de derechos, Tú has referido el tema de los términos judiciales, es decir, le dijeron que estaba por fuera de términos y por eso no le aceptaron un recurso. Y recientemente, porque estábamos ahorita en la audiencia, justamente en la pasada, llevé un caso a nombre de la Comisión ante la Corte Interamericana, el caso de Azul Rojas, en el que la Corte tiene que pronunciarse sobre qué prevalece más Repito, en una tensión que para mí es absolutamente inadmisible, que se crea que ahí debe haber una tensión. ¿Qué prevalece más, el término judicial o los derechos humanos? Eso es una tensión inadmisible. No puede uno concebir cómo la cuestión puramente formal de los términos judiciales vaya a tener alguna, siquiera alguna, algún enfrentamiento, siquiera... Me, 
ni siquiera para hacer un cotejo, pues para hacer un, una labor de, de apareamiento entre las cosas eh, con el derecho sustancial a la vida. Y resulta que en el caso de Azul Rojas, que es el de un muchacho LGBTI maltratado y violado por la policía contra el Perú, la preclusión de la investigación no la alcanzó a apelar una persona que nunca tuvo acceso a la justicia. Y cuando quiso apelar, entonces no, ayer se le había vencido el término. Y entonces, ante, el, ante los jueces, y qué pena, porque pues, la verdad es que me, me parecía terrible que alguien dijera, bueno, pero, pero si no apeló, ¿qué, ¿qué vamos a hacer? La verdad, yo casi que me daban ganas de decir, bueno, yo, perdóname, yo de esto sí sé, si quiere lo discutimos aquí en plena audiencia. El tema de las cuestiones meramente formales como los términos versus el, la prevalencia del derecho sustancial, porque eso es lo que debería ser el derecho procesal. No el derecho procesal de las formas, de los procedimentalismos, ¿eh? que es la manera más eh, fácil de violar derechos. Y pues yo aspiraría a que la Corte tome una decisión eh, sustancial en el caso, pero el, el tema este de la PLAS me haría pensar en eso, si realmente la prevalencia de los, de los términos judiciales puede realmente darse sobre los derechos humanos y sobre los derechos fundamentales. Eh, no, no son casos que tengan que ver con el Caribe y en ese sentido pues Margaret es la especialista, porque ella es la que, la que pertenece a, a uno de esos países que ustedes han traído a colación, pero también he conocido casos muy, muy graves de Guatemala, en los que tuve que llevar a nombre de la comisión casos en los cuales unos muchachos, se les castigaba en mi criterio el delito de haber nacido pobres. Entonces, desde cuando eran niños, pues niños de la calle, algún día se robaron un reloj, eh, ya del robo del reloj pasaron a la agresión a un muchacho dentro de la, de la correccional, de la correccional lo pasan a la cárcel, en la cárcel eh, tiene una riña y entonces todo se le va sumando y le van armando todo un prontuario y el muchachito que simplemente robó un reloj termina como un pavoroso delincuente al que hay que aplicarle la pena de muerte y le aplican la pena capital. Y cuando finalmente se logra, con decisión de la Corte Interamericana, que, se, que, que, que Guatemala tenga que abolir la pena de muerte, entonces le aplican una ley de fuga y los asesinaron finalmente. Y estoy hablando de muchísimos casos que se dieron, tres o cuatro de los cuales pude llevar ante la Corte. De manera que son cosas tan aberrantes, tan, tan increíbles, que entonces uno obviamente entiende lo que ustedes nos están tratando de, de transmitir. Lo tenemos muy claro, de manera que nosotros sí en algo eh, somos contundentes en que no es admisible, bajo ninguna circunstancia. El derecho penal no, no lo admitiría, un derecho penal liberal, un derecho penal democrático, no admitiría nunca que exista la posibilidad de que haya pena de muerte y por ende que sí tiene que ser abolida en los, en los países eh, del Caribe. Me agradaría simplemente para, para poder salir y darle la, la opinión a ustedes, salir, digo, del tiempo nuestro, eh, de Margarita y el mío, porque falta el presidente, eh, sería mm, que nos dijeran si ustedes tienen el registro de personas que tengan en este momento condena a pena de muerte en esos países. Y segundo, si hay alguna política pública de alguno de estos países tendiente a proscribirla, como para que cuando hagamos el balance final de lo que son los estados, podamos consignar alguna buena práctica en ese sentido en alguno de los países del Caribe. Muchas gracias, presidente. Gracias, comisionado. I will make an effort to speak in English to get closer to my brothers and sisters of the English-speaking Caribbean. Onamar, which is a 
very close to my heart. I am a convinced uh, abolitionist. And uh, the same as my colleagues. And I think uh, everybody in the commission is against the death penalty because it, that goes against the, the, the right of life. And as uh, Commissioner Vargas has just mentioned, any democratic society should, be, should get rid of the death penalty. A, social, a, a democracy is not consistent with the mere existence of the, death, of the death penalty. And I don't have to go into detail because that's part of your work and uh, it's part of your research and there are some uh, other international organizations. You mentioned uh, a decision by the European Court of Human Rights and we know that uh, one prerequisite to be a member of the European Union is to abolish the death penalty. That's, that goes to to the highest level of principles in the, in, in the European Union because exactly that runs contrary to the right of life. I want to, to, to thank you for the information you have brought to our attention. Uh, this document, this file that you have uh, put before us is very helpful. Uh, we, explain, we listened very carefully to the explanation made, but to, to be very honest, uh, this is the first time I see something so well done and with so uh, updated information. I was not aware, for instance, of the high number of people on the road in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, that's, that's really astonishing. And uh, um, uh, it helps me also to, to understand that actually the focus is on three, three countries, uh, Grenada, um, uh, Guyana, and Trinidad and, and Tobago. And that helps a lot in order to, to begin priorities. So we do have to get closer to those countries in order for those countries uh, to move to, uh, to uh, an abolitionist the, the, the euro. I was also struck when I, le when I heard from you that there are two women facing the death penalty in a, a precisely in, Go in Guyana. And, I, and I'm, I'm also wondering if any of the people on death row uh, is suffering any kind of a mental uh, disability, because that will also run contrary to, to, the, to the very basic principles on this matter. I, 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 I'm convinced that death penalty, uh, no matter how, what the method of execution is, is, runs against international law. How, however, we do have to protect those which are more vulnerable, like, like women who are now in, uh, in death row in Guyana, but I would also wonder if there's someone who's suffering uh, of, uh, of, of um, uh, mental disabilities, or probably someone who, who committed the crime when uh, he or she was a minor, which is also an, an, a, a, a matter in order to, be, to, to, to run a special concern. What do we have to do on this matter? And you made very concrete suggestions, recommendations, and recommendations that we are going to follow. We have also to, to create alliances with, uh, with, with civil society. Uh, the NGOs working on death penalty have done a lot of uh, a great work, and I attach great importance to the work that you have done, for instance, in the U.S. in order to, in order to, to 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 lobby at the state level uh, for those uh, states in the American Union to become abolitionists. There is a, a great deal to 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 be recognized to the work done by 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 NGOs. So the first thing that we have to do uh, precisely is a uh, to work with you with NGOs on this, on this matter. Uh, second, um, you, uh, you mentioned you have identified those countries where we have to, to work closer. Third, and uh, I think that uh, while we uh, advance on um, the abolition of death penalty in those countries, we also have to work on minimum legal standards which have to be followed at the criminal process. One was mentioned already by my colleague, uh, Commissioner Vargas, which has to do with the procedural default. Uh, that's that's a, a, um, a rule that should not be, uh, should, should not be ap applicable when we are dealing with the defense of life. And second, um, my colleague, uh, Commissioner McCullough, mentioned something that I think is uh, it's very important, which is also to work with countries on the matter of uh, clemency. Because uh, in many countries, it's, uh, clemency remains at the administrative level. And it's an, an administrative authority. And that does not give the, the, the um, 
uh, the sentenced person the opportunity to go and, and be heard before a, co a, a court of law in order to, to request a commutation of the, of the punishment. So those are areas, that are technical areas that uh, we, we have to work uh, closer. Um, but in addition, there's also a, a political work that we have to do with some other countries which are abolitionists de facto and who have, which have no problem in becoming abolitionists de jure. Because precisely the table that you are presenting to, to us shows those countries which have not applied the death penalty in recent years. So that should not be a problem in becoming a abolitionist uh, de jure. And of course they can do it at the national level through national means, but also they have at their disposal the American Convention, the protocol to the American Convention, and the second protocol to the, inter to the International uh, Covenant. So it's a political work that has to be done with those countries which have not applied uh, the, the death penalty, which the death penalty remains in, in their books, and there is no need to be uh, continued. Uh, you are very right, someone of you mentioned that uh, a public perception of the death penalty should not <laughs> prevent uh, uh, from a political leadership to push this matter. This goes beyond public per opinion. That, that, goes, that this goes to the highest values of a, dem of a democracy, and leaders have to take a role on that. Even in very difficult times, when we are facing problems of uh, uh, um, uh, safety, um, citizen security, and there is a, a trend in the region that um, they, uh, resorting to, uh, uh, to the criminal law, uh, resorting to imprisonment, is the solution to, to, um, uh, in, to, to problems of insecurity. And uh, we, we, there is scientific evidence that a higher penalty has no connection with the, re the reduction of, of criminality. And that's precisely the kind of arguments that goes, uh, runs against the death penalty in those countries. Well, in, in addition, I, what I also want to express to you that the commission attaches great importance to the question of the death penalty in the system of cases of petition. The commission is ready to issue precautionary measures uh, when uh, someone is in the death, in, in, on death row and has an execution uh, date. Uh, and the commission exercises its persaltum prerogatives in those cases before the, the commission that had to be uh, resolved in an expeditious uh, manner. Uh, we've been, and, and that was the reference made by my colleague, uh, Commissioner Vargas, we've been deciding recently uh, death penalty cases in the, in the U.S. in a very expeditious manner. And, and the Commission has discussed this matter, and now our um, um, uh, merit reports are advancing in the formulation of recommendations, which, in our view, will contribute to the emergence of a rule of international customary law prohibiting the death, the death penalty. We are uh, working on that direction, simply, exactly the same direction of the European Court we, will, we are not looking at the method of execution in order to condone death penalty. We are pronouncing ourselves against the death penalty for the same reasons that you explained very elo elo eloquently, and I don't want, want to repeat. I don't know if, I, if I, there's another thing, to probably, Margaret, and then we'll give a second uh, round of uh, comments to the uh, applicants. Please. Um, Whilst, whilst my brother, uh, you see, automatically I was trying to take off my headlocks. <laughs> whilst my brother, while was speaking, I remembered that I was actually sitting on the court when there was a vote in Parliament in Jamaica um, on the death penalty, whether the provision in the uh, Offence Against a Person Act should be retained. And the vote was, yes, it must be. I was so embarrassed, I can't tell you how much. When I returned to Jamaica at the end of that session, I asked the Minister of Justice, several other ministers who were lawyers, who were colleague lawyers, you know, and members of parliament, how could you? How could you pass such a, a resolution in the House? And they explained that they had to do that because this was the popular public 
con conclusion on the matter. So I said, since when did you go out and take a poll among the public? Because the majority of the public are poor, and it's their children who normally end up in, the, in death row. And of course, they couldn't answer that. And I went on further, and I strongly believe it, that that vote was not good governance. I said, because what is good governance is that you have laws that are implemented. You're not implementing this law, so why are you retaining it in the law books? You're not supposed to retain laws that you don't implement. But lots of the Caribbean countries who I've spoken to have that view. That though they are um, um, a de facto moratorium, it has to stay in the law. But then they can use it at any time. So we have a, a way that we can talk about their lack of good governance. <laughs> um. We have five last minutes at your disposal if you want to, to make final comments. Thank you, Thank you very much, Commissioners. Um, I'll, I'll try to pick up just on a few of the points. I mean, just starting on the, um, the point of public opinion, um, that was answered um, by Commissioner Hernandez. Uh, no countries in the world have abolished the death penalty because the public demand abolition. It's purely a question of leadership based on human rights principles. Um, it's a simple answer. And when you look at public opinion properly, um, it's very complex, it's not black and white, and the answer isn't the yes or no binary question. Um, we've, if you ask people in the majority of societies who have abolished the death penalty, um, the majority of people would support the death penalty in abstract. But when you ask much more complicated questions, um, you find that support, there's no real strength of support for the death penalty. There's very little knowledge, very little concern, and actually very little interest in capital punishment um, amongst the general population. So it really is a question of political leadership. Um, a couple of other uh, quick points. Uh, mental um, disorder and the death penalty is a huge concern. Our organization, we represent um, upwards to 60 prisoners in the Caribbean region. Um, hardly any of them are seen by a mental health professional before trial. So the answer to the question is, is that inevitably there will be people who suffer from mental disorders who are sentenced to death. And for the international standard, prohibiting um, the sentencing to death of people who suffer from intellectual disability, psychosocial disabilities, um, the onus must be on the state to ensure everybody is seen by a suitably qualified and trained forensic psychiatrist or psychologist. And this never happens. It happens when NGOs like my organization find doctors pro bono to assess people who have already been on death row for five years. And then we find, like in the case of Mr. Chandler, um, that he, he, is, um, he has psychiatric issues that have never been explored by the state. Um, so there's a serious failing on the part of the state in that particular respect. Um, a bit of positive news for Commissioner Macaulay. Um, after the hearing um, that we attended on the Cadogan case, that you were sitting on the court, um, the Caribbean Court of Justice has subsequently abolished the mandatory death penalty. Um, it wasn't done through compliance, unfortunately, um, but it was done through the Caribbean Court of Justice, um, through case law, um, they have quashed the mandatory death penalty, and the 10 prisoners who are currently on death row in Barbados will be resentenced, and none of them will be resentenced to death. So the statistics will change, and the death row population in Barbados will go down to zero in the next 12 months. Um, there were some other points, but I'll, I'll pass to my colleagues to see if they want to pick up on any of them. We have three minutes. Thank you very much, Commissioners, for your, for your comments. Um, I believe you had a question on um, vulnerable persons on death row, and for this, this is an issue of crucial importance. Um, for persons with mental disabilities, I think the issue is general in that um, there isn't a good practice of um, recognizing persons with mental disabilities, and this starts from as early as the court. Um, screenings are not done, and persons who do not belong in a, in a a detention center is placed there. And in the case of death penalty cases, I think that the issue is even more urgent. Um, it is contrary to international standards to impose the death penalty on someone with mental disabilities, and yet there is no consistent process for ensuring that that does not take place. 
Um, on the question of women, uh, there are women on death row, and um, Saul's organization has worked with women, um, including those uh, experiencing domestic violence. Um, and this is an, a crucial issue because often they represent intersectional identities where their gender also inter intersects with um, socioeconomic disadvantage as well. Um, and on this basis, that's why we have um, requested that the commission request information from states um, for disaggregated data on the, on the death row um, population to understand the vulnerabilities that exist. Thanks. Just one final comment. We're happy to follow up with the commission in writing with more details about the women who are on death row in Guyana, the public opinion poll that Saul mentioned, which will be out in December of this year. And we can definitely provide up-to-date information, which is very helpful as we continue this conversation. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Perfect. Thank you so much. The, the fight continues. And you ca please count on us. Muchas gracias a todos los asistentes. Esta ha sido la última audiencia de nuestros 174 periodos de sesiones. Agradecemos mucho que nos hayan acompañado, tanto presencialmente como aquellos que lo hicieron por el webcast. Nuestro agradecimiento más cumplido para Ecuador por habernos recibido, al Estado y a la sociedad civil de Ecuador por habernos, eh, para haber hecho posible que, que concesionáramos en esta bella ciudad de, de Quito y poder estar más cerca de, de la sociedad ecuatoriana. Quiero por último agradecer a los intérpretes que nos acompañaron en estas sesiones, han hecho un gran trabajo, a los técnicos, a los oficiales de sala y desde luego a mis queridos colegas de la Secretaría Ejecutiva de la Comisión Interamericana, para aquellos que regresan a casa, que tengan muy buen viaje. Las audiencias han terminado.